Battle of the Shadows. Or a defence of a petition tendered to the Lords of the Council of Scotland, by certain noblemen and gentlemen, January 1643. By William Drummond. Reader. If, in order to a due comprehension of the design of this. Battle of the Shadows. Thou wantest to know the occasion of it, t'was briefly this. The two houses of the English Parliament, having engaged in an open war against the King, anno 1642, and finding, by the successes in the autumn of that year, that the advantages bad manifestly fallen to the King's share, began to bethink themselves, without assistance they saw, they might readily come short of their aims, and what assistance more feasible or proper than that of their friends, the Scottish Covenanters? They, therefore, issued out a declaration, dated, November 17. 1642, bearing, that the king had given commissions to divers eminent and known papists, to raise forces, to compose an army in the north, that this army when raised, was to join with divers foreign forces, intended to be transported from beyond the seas, that by the instigation of the prelatical party, his majesty did already actually head malignant army, and all for the destruction of the parliament, and, thereby, the hindering of the reformation of the ecclesiastical government in England, so, much longed for by all true lovers of the Protestant religion. What, then, either more prudent or more seasonable, than that the Scots should bestir themselves, and raise forces, both to secure their own borders, and to assist England in suppressing the army of the Papists and foreigners, which was expected shortly to be on foot, and which, if not timely prevented, might prove as mischievous and destructive to Scotland as England. To counter this, the King sent a message, dated, December 6, 1642, to the lords of his council in Scotland, bearing, and in part demonstrating, that the above-mentioned particulars in the Parliament's declaration, were scandalous, groundless, and altogether false, and that, therefore, he was confident the Scots would not allow themselves to listen to them. And this his letter be ordered to be published, for quieting all fears, and keeping all his Scottish subjects to their duty. And accordingly published it was. This nettled all these covenanters, who were zealous to have church government in England reformed according to the Scottish model. If the king should prevail against the parliament, prelacy should be riveted in England, and so the whole late Scottish reformation might readily go to wreck. There was but too much ground to believe, that the securities they had obtained for its stability, were only notoriously extorted from the king, and that, had it not been for the circumstances his majesty was then in, he had never granted them. Something was therefore, to be done for supporting the interests of the English Parliament, but yet some such thing as might not amount to an open breach with the King. That was not yet seasonable. Martins were not yet sufficiently disposed nor adjusted for it. In short, the politic they pitched upon, was this, some noblemen, barons and burgesses, occasionally met at Edinburgh, to the commissioners of the Kirk word it, otherwise one would think they had met designedly, and applied to the commissioners of the General Assembly, who were then sitting, for their concurrence in a petition, whereby they might represent to the right honourable, the lords and other commissioners of Parliament, for the conservation of the peace, their humble thoughts and fears that the printing of His Majesty's letter, by warrant and command of the Right Honourable the Lords of His Majesty's Letter Privy Council, and the not printing of the declaration of both Houses of Parliament, unto which the printed letter was as answer, might be taken by the Kingdom of England's, as an approbation of the whole matter, and all the particulars which it did express, I give the very words of the Commissioners of the Kirk, and thereby might animate and provoke the Tish, nation, against them, as rebels or traitors. To this petition, the concurrence of the commissioners of the General Assembly was cheerfully granted. Indeed, as they themselves say, LT did homologar both in the end and means with their commission, and the matter of their present deliberations. And so it was presented. But after a few days, i.e. upon the 10th of January 1643, a contrary petition, that is, a petition against publishing the Parliament's declaration, already mentioned, was, by some noblemen and gentlemen, presented to the Lords of His Majesty's Privy Council, and it was called the Cross Petition, an exact copy whereof you have in the following treatise. This Cross Petition gave great offence to the Commissioners for conserving the peace, who condemned it by their Act, of the 18th of January, but greater yet, to the Commissioners of the General Assembly, who, much about that same time, published a thundering declaration against it, and now this treatise which our author was pleased to call, Battle of the Shadows, which you may translate, a fight either with or about a shadow and which was never published before, is his frank, free and round answer to that thundering declaration. This short account reader, is enough, to introduce thee to it. 
I am not so much, as to recommend, far less to defend it, only, if thou pleasest, thou mayest read it, and try if it recommends itself. Among all the sorts of people on the face of the earth, Christians should be of the most mild and peaceable disposition, humble, gentle, merciful, bountiful and charitable, not only towards those of their own profession, but even to such we are without, and to all men in general. Amongst all Christians they who bear a public charge in the Church of God, and who are advanced to teach and govern his people, should be eminent, as in their places, so in these Christian virtues, and in the practice of every pious duty towards all men. They should not be lifted up with pride, double-tongued, strikers, brawlers. Of these holy endeavours glory ariseth to God and peace to men. But so soon as they who bear a public charge in the church and should be examples and precedents of holiness to others, begin to breath great matters, and altogether estranged from their vocation, or contrary to it, and strive to prostrate princes and people to their will and pleasure, seek to prescribe laws to all, as if all were their subjects, confound holy and profane things together, and instead of the mild doctrine of our Master Jesus Christ, and being ambassadors of the glad tidings of salvation, become heralds of war, of preachers turning soldiers, and for gowns delighting to glance in steel and arms, then everything turneth upside down, divisions, discords and tumults not only arise and multiply in kingdoms but in every city, nay almost in every family. The fire and the air put out of their natural places, make not more horrible shakings of the body of the earth, than these men do of the politic bodies of kingdoms and commonwealths, confounding the inhabitants of this world. The late bloody wars of Europe can witness this, the fearful distractions of this isle represent this unto us as in a mirror. And if the mercies of Almighty God were not inexpressible towards us, these men would yet us in our own blood, involving us in most uncivil wars amongst ourselves, and make us a prey to strangers. If small things may be compared to great, what a small spark would these men lately have blown up into a bonfire? What a little brook made swell to a violent torrent, to overflow and drown this miserable kingdom? The king's majesty being driven, through the ambition of some persons, by the force and violence of rude and tumultuous assemblies, from the city of London and his house of parliament, any in colluvion rerum magestatum swam contumelia offeret, after the authors of these combinations had sent a declaration to his subjects of Scotland to afford them speedy and powerful assistance, raise arms for their defence against him, he sent a letter to the lords of his privy, Council of Scotland, declaring, the unjust proceedings of this oligarchic power against his royal person and kingly office, and of the equity of his taking of arms, for the vindicating of his crown and state from the implacable malice of those men recommending to the lords of his privy council, that this letter should be communicated and published to all his loving subjects. His Majesty's most reasonable command was no sooner obeyed, when some men, whose ease and rest is only amidst factions, seditions and wars, who never find their accounts and reckonings right, nor any safety for their persons but in the trouble of the state of the kingdom, being like chirurgeons and sextons, who thrive and wax more wealthy by the death and plague of the common people, umbrageously, and with simulate devotion stir some noblemen and gentlemen, ignorant of their hidden and Mystericus intentions with a number of the credulous clergy, to assemble and gather together from sundry parts of the kingdom, and present to the commissioners appointed by the King's Majesty and his Parliament of Scotland, for preserving the articles of the Treaty of Peace established between the two kingdoms, a supplication for publishing the declaration of the pretended Parliament of England to the subjects of Scotland, together with His Majesty's letter that the Parliament's declaration, with equal power, credit and authority, should appear to the world at the same time, and withdraw the hearts of the people from their sovereign. This form of proceeding, how specious soever in the outward pretenses of religion, and varnished cunningly over, seeming tumultuous and scandalous, and that very fame which was practised by the oligarchy of the Parliament at London, in suborning the multitude, and causing them give in those petitions to the Parliament, which some of themselves had long before limbed to the life, and formed, and which in effect dissolved the body of that great council, and His Majesty's honour and authority. Being wounded in that declaration, some noblemen and gentlemen, to whom the King's Majesty's honour had ever been dear, out of fear of His Majesty's interest, and their forefight of imminent dangers to the state of this kingdom, tendered a petition to the commissioners for the Treaty of Peace, of which this is a true copy. The humble petition of the noblemen, barons, gentlemen and others, presented by the Earl of Home to His Majesty's Privy Council, and answered to the 10th of January 1643. That, whereas His Majesty, with advice and consent of his great council the Estates of Parliament, hath been pleased to select your lordships to be his council, and as by an act of the late Parliament commit read to your lordships the administration of this kingdom in all affairs, concerning the peace, 
good and happiness thereof, and in regard of trust reposed by His Majesty and estates of Parliament in your Lordship's wisdom, fidelity and care, we are confident your Lordships have been and will. Continue to careful to acquit yourselves of that weighty charge, as you may be answerable for all your actions and proceedings to His Majesty and estates of Parliament, to whom, as we conceive, you are and can only be accountable. And now we being informed of a petition presented by some noble men, gentlemen and others, to the commissioners, for conserving the articles of the late treaty, upon a pretext of your lordships not sitting at that present time, wherein it is represented, that your lordships late warrant for printing his majesty's letter, hath occasioned the great grief and heavy regret of all who tender the glory of God, his majesty's honour, the promoting the unity of religion and uniformity of church. Government, the continuance of peace and unity betwixt the two kingdoms and fearing, if at this time we should be silent, your lordships should conceive us and the rest of the kingdom to be involved with them in the like desires, judgment and opinion, and left by our silence our gracious sovereign the king should believe us wanting in the duty and allegiance, which by so many ties and obligations we owe to him our native king, or that our brethren of England should apprehend the least intention or desire in us to infringe, or any ways to encroach upon that. Brotherly union of the two kingdoms, so happily united under one head, we presume in all humility to clear ourselves and our intentions to your lordships and all the world and thereby to represent our humble wishes and desires for establishing his majesty's royal authority, and continuing that happy union betwixt the two kingdoms, which can never truly be conceived to be intended to weaken the head, whereby it's knit together, and without which it can have no subsistence. The happy union of the two kingdoms under one head and king, doth so much add to his majesty's greatness, and strength of both kingdoms, that no honest British subject can choose, but with us wish that the said brotherly union may be heartily entertained and cherished by all fair and reasonable means, to which we conceive not one thing will so much conduce, as that the late articles of the Treaty of Peace, and conclusion taken thereupon, anent the unity of religion, may be carefully and truly. Prosecute, wherein as our commissioners then, so we now, without presuming or usurping to prescribe laws and rules of reformation to our neighbour kingdom, civil liberty and conscience being so tender, that it cannot endure to be touched but by such as they are wedded unto, and have lawful authority over them, notwithstanding, seeing the duty of charity doth oblige all Christians to pray and profess their desires, that all others were of that same religion with themselves, and since we all. Acknowledge that religion is the base and foundation of kingdoms, and the strongest bond to thy subjects to their princes it true loyalty, and to knit their hearts unto one another in true unity. We cannot but heartily with, that this work of union, so happily begun, may be crowned and strengthened by the unity of religion and church government, and that your lordships with us, may be pleased to represent it to his majesty and both houses of parliament, as an expression and testimony of our affections to the good of our brethren of England, and of our desires to make firm and stable our brotherly union, by the strongest chain and bulwark of religion. But, as we have said, intending no ways thereby to pass our bounds, in prescribing or setting down rules and limits to His Majesty, and the Houses of Parliament, their wisdom and authority in the way of prosecution hereof. The sense we have of the great calamities and irreparable evils, which, up an occasion of these unhappy distractions or mistakes betwixt the King's Majesty and Houses of Parliament of England, which, if not speedily removed, cannot but produce the fearful and prodigious effects of a bloody and civil war, obligeth us, in the duty of Christianity, and as feeling members of what may concern our common head, the King's Majesty, and the good and happiness of our brethren of England, humbly to represent to your lordships, that, as we will not be wanting with our prayers, and our faithful and best endeavours, to assist the removing of these unhappy mistakes and misunderstandings, so we heartily with, and humbly petition your lordships, from the deepness of your wisdom, that some such happy motions may how, as with a tender care, our sovereign, his person and authority, peace and truth may be settled in all his majesty's dominions, and altho, we will not presume, nor take upon us, to, Prescribe laws and rules to your lordships, yet, in humility, we entreat your lordships' permission, to represent such particulars, as we conceive, and are very confident, will much conduce to the removing of all these mistakes between His Majesty and the two houses of parliament, and be a ready mean to facilitate a happy and wished peace, and continue the brotherly union betwixt the two kingdoms. And first, that in answering the foresaid petition, your lordships may be pleased to do no act which may give his majesty just occasion to repent him of that trust he so graciously expresseth in his letter, of the date, the first of December, he reposeth in us his subjects of this his ancient and native kingdom, for we cannot think that our brethren of England, or any other, can believe, that, the ground of this mutual union of the two nations, being the several and respective union to our Prince and head, we should not acknowledge the strong bond whereby it is knit, 
and to which we are so firmly tied, by so many ages and unparalleled lineal descents of a hundred and seven kings, neither can we suppose, that any good Protestant or true member of our church, can imagine, far less seduce others to believe, that, by the late treaty of peace, on act of union, we, as Scottish subjects, are in sort liberate from that dutiful obedience, which, as Scotsmen, we owe to our king, or from that due loyalty, which, as Scottish subjects, we owe to our native sovereign, for maintenance of his person, greatness and authority, or, that thereby we are in any other condition in these necessary duties to our sovereign, than we and our ancestors were, and have been, these many ages and descents, before the making of the said act, or before the swearing and subscribing of our late covenant, by which we have solemnly sworn, and do swear, not only our mutual concurrence and assistance for, the cause of religion, and, to the uttermost of our power, with our means and lives, to stand to the defence of our dread sovereign, his person and authority, in the defence and preservation of the said true religion, liberties, and laws of this church and kingdom, but also, in every cause which may concern his majesty's honour, shall, according to the laws of this kingdom, and duty of good subjects, conner with our friends and followers, in quiet manner, or in arms, as we shall be required by his majesty, his counsel, or any having his authority. Secondly, that if your lordships think it fitting, to make an answer to the Parliament of England their declaration, your lordships may be pleased, not to declare, enact or promise anything which may trouble or disturb the peace of the Church and Kingdom, which, by God's special grace, and His Majesty's favour and goodness, we enjoy, and have established unto us, according to our heart's desire, by the laws ecclesiastical, and civil laws of this Kingdom, respective, and, which His Majesty hath. Since, by so many declarations, and deep protestations, sworn to maintain inviolably. Thirdly, that your lordships may be pleased to consider, that as nothing will more diminish his majesty's greatness, than that his kingdom should consume in civil wars, so nothing will more conduce to the suppression of insolent papists, malignant schismatics, disloyal brownists and separatists, the special, if not sole promoters and fomenters of these unhappy misunderstandings, than that humbly and freely, without respect of worldly ends. Secondary considerations, we give to Christ, that which is Christ's, and to Caesar, that which is Caesar's, by means whereof, the truth and purity of religion, shall be established, to the utter confusion of all these sectaries, and true monarchical government firmly settled, by which likewise laws and authority shall retain their natural strength and vigour, to the suppression of all commotions, and tumultuary conventions, the bane and overthrow of all true religion and policy. Fourthly, although there be nothing farther from our minds, than to carp, and far less to presume to question, or crave of your lordships an account of your actions, as knowing perfectly by the inviolable laws and customs of this kingdom, that to be only due and proper to the king and parliament, from whence you have that great charge and trust derived to you, yet we hope your lordships will give us leave, in all humility, to remember your lordships of your deliverance, June 1, 1642 which closed with these words, and are confident, that as from the said lords, the petitioners neither have nor shall have necessity, so they will not trouble themselves nor the council hereafter, with supplications of this kind, and that your lordships and your wisdoms will take some course for preventing all occasions, which may in any sort disturb the peace of this kingdom, or make division amongst the subjects thereof. No sooner was this petition presented to the commissioners, when some of the clergy, of imperious and stormy dispositions, men looking through multiplying glasses, haughty by their place and arbitrary power, as being commissioners for the general assembly, who, suppose what they say will be accepted, more for authority of their persons, than weight of their proofs, or else, that any word will slide easily into the minds of those who are lulled in the humour of the same inclination, object protest, and supplicate against it, and not content to have had all satisfaction offered to them, and to have obtained what they most required of the commissioners for the treaty of peace, neither respecting the good and honest meaning of the noblemen, nor their places, nor some of their former securities in the late troubles, as if they would raise trophies of their victories, when it had been better to have covered wounds of shame, with a veil of silence, not only published a declaration, against their petition, but against their persons, and which no papist ever would have done, except in the porch of a church, caused, as if it had been a new evangel and authentic scripture, to insatuate the credulity of the silly vulgar, fill their heads with doubts, and their hearts with gall, read it with all solemnity through most of the churches of the country, verifying, that immoderata potentia non diumanit intra iastas meters.
It is strange, the commissioners of an assembly should publish a declaration of such a subject, and in such terms, which the whole body of an assembly could hardly justify to be honest, decent or just, except they should be brought to believe that the church cannot err, and that what they publish and disperse abroad, should have authority, reverence and reputation of the written word, and what they call abomination in the church of Rome, this pretending to have an unerring spirit, to approve in their own church as orthodox doctrine. Brethren, general councils have been contrary one to another and so have general assemblies, all men are liars in their words, and sinners in their works, says David. A great favour of the churchmen, said the church had the keys of authority given her, but not the keys of knowledge, which, if true, the many ways may err, especially when the meddleth with matters which are not within her horizon, and thus, with our heresy, her declarations may suffer an answer. To have power to publish declarations, and to suffer none to reply unto them, and answer them, is to deprive a commonwealth of her liberty, liberty of life say a Seth, when liberty of speech say a Seth, many would restrain themselves from doing evil, if they were assured that their deeds would be recorded, and many years remembered, after they had left the stage of this world. Your declaration, in which there is no clear connection of the matters therein contained, being made up of observations and animadversions, gives out a sentence condemnatory against our petition, that it is nothing but a secret plot, and subtle undermining of all the present designs of this Kirk and Kingdom, for unity of religion, and all the work of God, in this land. And although it may seem but an error in the doing, yet doth it imply contempt, usurpation, and division, and, being winked at, may be the cause of much disturbance and confusion in these times. Since there is no proposition, but another may be given out contradictory and against it, we affirm, that our petition is the only chain to keep the unity of religion and the state, and to continue the blessings of God in this land. And that the first petition is a great engine, plotted and found out to break the unity of religion and state, deprive us of the blessings of God, by disturbing the peace of the land, implying usurpation and division, and, it is had been winked at, might have been the cause of all division, rebellion, sedition, and most horrible confusions. Brethren, ye labour to prove your proposition, because that when ye, the great commissioners of the general assembly, inquisitors of the faith, and men of unerring spirits, for it hath been disputed in the schools of Spain, if the father's inquisitors may err, were fitting concerning matters meddled within our petition, we private persons, did not so much as acquaint you with our intentions. Petitions to the Lords of Council, and to the Commissioners for the Treaty of Peace, which are not first presented to the Commissioners of the General Assembly, they then in their consistory fitting, are against the unity of religion, and the work of God, in the land, cause divisions and disturbances, imply contempt, usurpation and division, this is too great an eight who are on demand, to be granted to you. And since ye have not any act of your assemblies for it, nay, though ye had, we refer it to your probation, requiring you to answer us, if ye think lords of parliament and state, who tendered this petition, but only private men? If ye value yourselves to high, that no petitions may be tendered by private men to a council or judges, except they first be presented to you and have your approbation? We hold you usurpers upon the laws of this kingdoms and contemners of royal authority, and men who would take unto yourselves a vast unlimited seditious jurisdiction, by the exercise of an arbitrary power over the lives, liberties and estates of the lieges of this kingdom, and who strive not only to be above men, but man's kind? Did ever the Spanish Inquisition arise to this presumption, make any law against pestioning judges? Were the lords of the Commission for the Peace, of so weak understandings and shallow brains, that they could not discern the equity of a petition, except it came first to your hands, and ye gave it by the way some perfume, to make it more fragrant? Tell us, by what laws do ye usurp over your brethren? Have your high places made you, like the great angels, forget that power by which ye ascend unto them? Where was there any law, that any might not petition God and man, except that of Darius? Is not this not only to be popish, but the Pope himself, who will suffer no man to enter the gates of heaven, except by St. Peter's kais? Have we rejected the High Commission, to set over us men more rigid, supercilious and severe, than the Spanish Inquisitions themselves? Let the times present and posterity be judges, if this be any great reason, to have so violently invaded our petition, and traduced us. The matter is next taxed, and the petition challenged, that it containeth only the suppression of insolent papists, malignant schismatics, disloyal bromnists and separatists and parseth by the prelates, that it casteth directly aspersions upon those who are most zealous for the reformation in England, and new trimmers of religion, that we name the parliament and those zealots of reformation, brownists, separatists, authors of tumultuary conventions, that we desire the work to be prosecuted. 
without presuming or usurping to prescribe laws and rules of reformation to our neighbours, that we are not involved with you in those same desires, judgments and opinions, will not against the dictum of our consciences vote and renounce our own judgments, and captivate them to the sense of others, because we condemn you in those particulars, in which we justify ourselves. That this is to overturn the foundation of all your endeavours for the work of reformations. That this petition reflecteth upon you for your joining in the petition concerning the printed letter of His Majesty, that ye are involved in breach of duty and allegiance to the King's Majesty, and commissioners for preserving the peace, who did hearken to your petition, by causing print the declaration of the Parliament of England. That we declare, that we think ourselves obliged, in every cause which may concern His Majesty's honour, to concur with our friends and followers in quiet manner, or in arms, as we shall be required of His Majesty or Council, or any having His authority. That we rest and misapply our national covenant for our private ends. That all these together overturn the foundation of all your endeavours, frustrate all that hath been done, or is now in doing out of your pious intentions, many other aspersions are cast upon our petition, to answer every one of which, would be to consume time and blot paper. We require you, brethren, to express in more plain terms what great foundations of reformation, and principal aims of yours, we have endeavoured to overturn, Wherein have we offended, in setting down Brownists, Separatists, Schismatics, Papists, and passing over prelares? Is our advice evil, that we desire nor to prescribe laws to our neighbours? You will say, that ye intend a reformation of the Church of England, and a conforming of it to the government of the Kirk of Scotland, to which we seem to be refractory. This, brethren, is our with, the earnest desire of our hearts, to this we would contribute all our diligence and best endeavours, so it might be peaceably brought to pass, and without troubling the state of our neighbour country. But these honest intentions of ours, and this great change, what if the King's Majesty, and such of the nobility, gentry and commons of England, who are of his opinion, full oppose, and will not suffer the governant of their church to be altered, it being after their opinions or apprehensions, more conformed to the monarchical government of the state than our presbyterial, which is more conformed to the government of a republic and carton towns. For where equality is, a monarchy hardly is maintained, and consuata longo tempore etiamsi deteriora, in sweatis minus molester il solent. Will ye arise in arms, will ye embrew your hands in the blood of those for whom Jesus Christ hath shed his? And stir up his majesty's subjects to a cruel war against him, eh, and while he abolish his episcopal government, and our presbyterial be embraced. And for this cause will ye hazard your lives, estates, and fortunes, fight it out to the last man in both kingdoms? We think this aim and foundation neither to agree with faith nor reason, and if you preach this doctrine to a good people, we think ye give them serpents for fish, and stones for bread. Since the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, a eh? religion is a power sufficient for itself, should be persuaded and not enforced, and is not to be maintained with humane fire. It is written, God shall persuade Japhet to dwell in the tents of Sem, nor one word of fighting. Did our Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles propagate their religion by pikes and muskets? Where find you it is lawful for Christians to establish their religion by arms? It is a special maxim amongst the Turks to determine and establish religion by arms. The church should be planted by the spiritual sword, not the material, the souls of men being spiritual substances, lead and iron will not work upon them. The remedy of arms is not that which we should seek after to amend their diseases and infirmities. Spirits are not overcome save by reason, they will not be constrained and forced to believe but by persuasion, homins duci volant non cogi. This will be to tyrannize over the consciences, which in the beginning of the reformation of the religion in Germany and France, by all the Protestants was cried out upon, and condemned as tyrannical and antichristian. Faction is ever humble till it get the keys of power. But though it were lawful to propagate religion by arms, where find ye it is lawful to shed Christian blood for the external form of the government of the church? It is universally approved that monarchy, aristocracy and popular government, making the men who bear these charges good, are all good and honest in a state, and why may not these same sorts of government be received in any Christian church? All forms not corrupted are good, and none can discern what is best, save by what is possiest, since every change is dangerous, especially a recourse to extraordinary means, for matters which by ordinary may be performed. New councils are always more plausible than fate. The form of the government of a church had been no small impediment to the progress of the doctrine of it. And some countries might have received the doctrine, if they had not been terrified with the form of government. 
neither is it likely, pagan kingdoms, as is that of China, would alter their idolatrous religion, and exchange it with the form of our church government, not because the doctrine, but contrariety of the church government to their forms, as also the kingdoms under the Spanish monarchy, which can hardly subsist if their government should be taken away or altered. A war for the government of the church will incline rather to ambition than religion, and if we shall fight for religion, this war shall turn immortal and without end, for of a war begun for religion, we shall find a war of state. If it not been found by experience, semel motis imperius non facile pacem restitui posse? But against whom in this war are ye to take arms? Against your king. Perhaps ye spare and forbear your king, and render him that respect which is due to such a majesty, in declaring it is against his counsellors, naming them malignants, incendiaries and enemies, but is not this to blame the judgment of your sovereign, and to check the choice and election which he makes of his magistrates and officers? Is not this to honour him in show, and in effect and really to contemn him? It is sufficient that we have brought our own country to the state it is presently in, though by essaying and striving to amend and reform our neighbour, we leave it not in a worse estate that we found it. Why should we undergo a certain trouble for an uncertain good? When men cannot do the good that they would, they should not be the occasion of greater evils. A good work impiously managed, doth merit no more than an evil. But such is the nature of dominion, and to bear sway over others, that once finding any yielding or flexibility, it never thinks it hath enough, unless it hath more than sufficient, and then it can hold. But concerning these opinions, let us not forget what the affirmative concession of faith of the Church of Scotland containeth, as is set down in the Scottish Acts of Parliament. Nor do we think that one order in ceremonies can be appointed for all ages, tinies and places, for as ceremonies, such as men have devised, are but temporal, so may and ought they to be changed. Whosoever goes about to take away or confound the state of civil policy, now long established, we affirm the same men, not only to be enemies to mankind, but also wickedly to fight against God's expressed will. We confess and avouch, that such as resist the supreme power, doing that thing which appertains to his charge, do resist God's ordinance, and we affirm, that whosoever denies unto him aid, their counsel and comfort, that the same men deny their help, support and counsel to God, who, by the presence of his lieutenant, does crave it of them. If the alteration and reformation ye intend, and which ye think necessary, both in church and state, must be made by blood, we are of different minds and opinion from you, and we entreat you not to harbour such outrageous and cruel thoughts, repent, and pray unto God, if perhaps the thought of your hearts may be forgiven you, for ye are in the gall of bitterness, and bond of iniquity, b. 4. Whereby blood ye shall make three proselytes, ye shall make a hundred hypocrites, epicureans, and men of no religion, who neither care for Presbyterian nor Episcopal government of the church, and by establishing or lessening some supposed forms of superstition in our neighbour country, ye shall plant and increase atheism, a hundred times worse than superstition, as anarchy is more detestable than the greatest tyranny. Beautiful are the feet of them that preach peace, faith a prophet, and we may say, cursed are the hands of those that denounce war. Do you take it to be a matter of small importance, not only to afford the occasion, but to lay down the project, for making a schism in the true Protestant religion, for the religion professed in England these eighty years bypassed, and above, hath ever been, by all the Protestant churches in Europe, acknowledged to be orthodox, and that it is lawful now, when this religion is so much impaired, weakened and brought under, in the other kingdoms of Europe. The Grison Italian churches are utterly defaced, the gospel in Bohemia extirpated, the Palatinate is devoured, the French churches live only during pleasure, the German churches are all shaken, and half destroyed to imbrue our hands in our own blood, and decide, by arms, whether the professors thereof shall be governed by some few good men, and well chosen amongst ourselves, which is aristocracy, or, by the laws and directions of many, which is democracy. Man getteth not that mischief, but what he seeketh and buyeth with his own foolishness. Brethren, these times require other meditations, and calmer thoughts. Take a view of the map of the earth, there ye shall find that the kingdom of Scotland is not all the earth, and that England and it together, make but one, not immense, LSLE. Now, being so blessedly contented by your late reformation, as ye are, why seek ye to involve yourselves in the debates and quarrels of another kingdom? Ye are men of great faith, if ye believe the English will enslave their understandings and opinions in points of religion, to the Scots, the receiving of religion, in the politic consideration, being holden a point of servitude, and establish our presbyterial forms in their church. 
neither have they promised any such matter by their return to the commissioners of our general assembly, only they desire some godly and learned divines of our church, to be sent to them, by whose advice, an uniformity in church government may be obtained, which seemeth to import, they have an intention to alter the present form of our government, and a more easy passage made to the settling of one confession of faith, one liturgy, one catechism. And here ye are to fight for a religion, at least, government of the church, which but yet is in Sierra. The old law should be our guide till the new be made. By too much trust in bladders, we may put ourselves in hazard of sinking under water, we may find these but fair pretexts, till by our means, they have brought forward their hidden intentions, and sufficient to besot men, who would ever have religion new trimmed, the powder of projection to dim the eyes of the rude Scot, as we were wont by them to be stilled. Our petition is branded, that it doth indirectly cast foul aspersions on those who are the greatest zealots for the Reformation in England, and that it symbolizeth with the prelatical party, calling the Parliament, and all that seek after Reformation, Brownists, Separatists and authors of tumultuary conventions. Brethren, this assertion is your own, it is not in our petition, and we give you many thanks for it, and so may your Parliament, for gathering off from our autocedent, such a consequent. Is it not Brownism, to admit mechanical persons to preach in churches, and men who had not taken imposition of hands, nor any orders, knowing first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation, see? Are not these men separatists, who have separated themselves not only from the government, but from the doctrine, which have continued in the Church of England, all the time of the reigns of King Edward VI, Queen Elizabeth, and King James, who refuse communion with the Church of England, as much as the papists do? Are nor these men authors of tumultuary conventions, who, to menace the king's majesty, and his peers of parliament, not only brought the confused multitude of artificers, apprentices, but the desperate ship boys, watermen, and a rabble of women landresses, boards, with the infamous rascality which posterity will hold hyperbolical. Such are many, who have voices among it the commons of the lower house, besides felt makers, a coachman of a lord of parliament, was permitted to preach. And that this is no fiction, we appeal to the knowledge of our commissioners, at that time in the great city. A parliament is a convention of the three estates, peers, clergy, and commons, over which is the king, the son, the soul, and life of the body. Neither is it other ways taken and understood, in all the kingdoms of Europe. Where are here amongst these men, the three estates? You will easily reply, two of these estates have cut off the third, fallen into a gangrene, and if the right hand should cut off the left, may not men say, that that body wants a hand? And why might not as well the peers and clergy, cut off the commons? The first parliament in France, England and Scotland, were the king's councillors only, and such who were cited and required by the king's letter, to assist them. Parliaments in all places, have been erected by kings, as the Parliament of Paris by Philip le Bel, the Parliament of England, by Henry I. And historiographers affirm, that the kings of England, before him, did never call the common people to counsel. These men, if we will give credit to the declaration of a prince, or give faith to deeds, rather than words, are not a parliament, but a number of men, whose hatred and malice to the king's person is implacable, and their contempt of him and his authority visible and erroneous, supported by the insolence and licentiousness of the people, to satisfy their own private ends and ambition, for offices and preferments, entered into a solemn league and combination, to alter the government of church and state, manifestly showing, they minded only to serve themselves, and neither prince nor state, d. Neither are they in number considerable, for, for above five hundred of the members of the House of Commons, there are not there now above eighty, and above an hundred of the House of Peers, not above fifteen or sixteen, all which, are so awed by the multitude of Anabaptists, Brownists, and other persons desperate, and of decayed fortunes, that their consultations have not the freedom and liberty of a parliament. These men, it is true, sit in the place of the Parliament, as the Antichrist sitteth in the Church of God, excommunicating, prescribing, pursuing, by fire and sword, the true Church, governing as the thirty tyrants did the people of Athens, at their best, they are but servants usurping the chairs of their masters, and give us leave to cry to them, O Saturnalia. These men pretend one thing and intend another, they make the gross people, and the rude Scot believe, their aims are altogether religion, and a reformation of the abuses of the church, to uphold their desperate attempts, but their intentions are quite contrary, being change of places, dignities and offices of state and court, and all commodities, sale of bishops' lands, by displacing the faithful servants of the king, to open a way to their own dependence, preferring profit to honesty, as their nineteen propositions plainly declare, in all which, there is nor one word of religion. 
Such a savage disposition and brutish rage, have invaded the minds of the men of this generation, they promise to themselves the Leon skin, which is yet alive. The painted visit of wise proceedings often deludeth those who know not the face lurking under wicked counsels may be varnished with the shining oil of sly pretenses. They are like apothecaries' boxes, quorum titulae babent remedia, picksides venena, now, if the parliament be such men, as they are here set down, these consequences are true, which ye say ye have indirectly found in our petition, though they were far from our intentions. We are challenged, that we are not involved with you, in those same desires, judgments and opinions, which is as much, as if you would challenge us for that we think not your thoughts, and will not, against our consciences, vote and renounce our own judgments, and captivate them to the sense of yours. Where so many pots, so many brains, are a-boiling, there must needs be a great deal of froth. What a gross opinion and logger-headed Switzer judgment was this! That it was a tender and dutiful respect to His Majesty's honour, to supplicate the Lords of His Majesty's Council, and the Commissioners for the Treaty of Peace, to print and publish the Declaration of the Pretended Parliament, jointly with the letter of your Sacred Sovereign? Where was the discretion of so many grave men, unerring spirits? Where there is no necessity for men to throw themselves upon seen and manifest dangers, hath ever been thought to have more rashness than wisdom and true worth? There was no necessity to publish the declaration of the Parliament, forsooth, say ye, because the King's letter was published, ye would not have the Parliament of England interior to the King of Scotland. The Lords of the Council of Scotland, had their master's command and authority to print his letter, neither did he send hither, before he was by that declaration awakened, but there was neither request nor entreaty, that we know, from that pretended Parliament, to publish their declaration to the Council, and if there had been, it would not have been, it should not have been granted, yet, some few deceived men, male contented humorists mere spirits of contradiction and disobedience, who know not. To discern between marble colours and real bodies, the pretended Parliament's agents, did here precipitate themselves, as if every one of them had been interested to cause print that declaration. Because, say they, Scotland being in the like case, and declarations being then published against us, they were, by these parliamentary men, suppressed, which is a manifest untruth. For, till we had given satisfaction to the King's Majesty, until after the Treaty of Peace, they were never forbidden nor suppressed, it had been soon enough for us, after an accommodation with their prince, to have suppressed or paralleled these papers. Brethren, whose subjects are ye? Hold ye your estates, offices, places arid lands of any English man? Did ye swear your oath of fidelity, homage, and supremacy to the distempered heads of Kim Bolton, Hamden, P.Y.M., Strod, Hazelrig, Martin, Wilkie, Toll, Sir John Ray, Sir Gilles Goosecap, Sir Henry Vane, or others of such calibre? Why did ye attempt to match any foreign declaration, though just, with your sovereign? Why did ye theirs? Who absolved you of your oath of fidelity to your sovereign? When gave you it to the English pretended Parliament? How consists this with your late protestations, to defend the honour, person, and prerogatives of your liege lord and master the king? Are ye not afraid to boggle thus with God Almighty? To dispense with oaths, and equivocate Jesuitically turned sovereignty into a kind of platonic idea, hovering in the air. Ye would make the world believe ye had a part in these men's conspiracy, by your approving of it thus far, and partaking with them in the fault, ye would also take a part in their defence, and partake in their fortunes. If that declaration of the pretended Parliament be dangerous to the state of this kingdom, and full of sedition, and if the yielding to what is required in it may bring desolation to this kingdom, then is the publishing of it dangerous, and no less the supplication presented to the Lords for that effect, such it is. We have now peace, thanks to Almighty God, but if we shall, according to that paper, raise speedy and powerful arms, repenting a flagitia meliora, to the aid and assistance of the authors of that declaration, we cannot shun but enter into a civil war and manifest rebellion, for the one half of this LSLE shall be in arms against the other. A declaration, in which the King's Majesty is traduced, and his authority wronged, is a seditious declaration, such as that. For, notwithstanding of all the oaths, protestations, and declarations, which the King's Majesty hath made for the maintenance of the true Protestant religion, he is in this declaration traduced, and that he is to raise foreign forces to be transported from beyond the seas, for the destruction of the religion and liberties of his Kingdom of England, which is to give him an open lie, which no private gentleman of honour would suffer from his equal. A declaration from men guilty and impeached of high treason, imploring aid to strengthen them in their attempts, is a treasonable declaration such as that, the chief authors of that declaration wanting nothing but a jury to suffer as traitors, when proceeded against legally. 
For that, to lessen your fault and varnish your error, ye declare that we would insinuate the commissioners for conserving the peace and the lords of council, to be involved in the same breach of allegiance, by reason of the grant of your desire in giving way to print the pretended Parliament's declaration. We had never such thoughts, nor can any have them of their lordships, they have not done anything amiss nor are they culpable with you. For except they had given way to your petition, they could not have preserved the peace, and their lordships granting the publication thereof, doth not import the approbation of the contents of it. Neither did that declaration flourish with such rhetoric and eloquence, that it had force to move the affectious, and stir up the peccant humour of the silliest Scots man, whose brain was not long before vitiated, and had all wit beaten out of it by the clamours of ignorant creatures, to leave the defence of his native kings and tumultuously take arms for the aid of strangers, since that which was petitioned dared not have been refused, for ye were ready by your band dogs, the multitude maugre. All the judges, to have effectuated by violence what ye petitioned for the fashion. No, it was wisdom in them not to appear, nor give any token that it was against their wills, but to deal with you and it, as if they had been of your party and minds. Now, ye having sworn in your covenant, that ye shall not attempt anything that may turn to the diminution of the king's greatness and authority, but on the contrary, that ye shall, to the uttermost of your power, with your lives and fortunes, stand to the defence of your dread sovereign his person and authority, and having importuned the judges with treasonable solicitations, and caused print a scandalous declaration sent from men declared rebels by the king himself, and who are in arms against him, if God prevent not the mischief, to invade his person and lay his honour in the dust, ye have done contrary to your oath, and are in the highest degree covenant breakers. But this is not all, for according to your own gloss in your own declaration, who breaketh one of the articles of your covenant is guilty of them all, it being copulative, O new and ever till now concealed decalogue. Ye are massmongers, adorers of angels, worshippers of images, invokers of the defunct saints, cringers to crucifixes, approvers of purgatory, of justification of works, auricular confession, seven sacraments, transubstantiation, nundination of pardons, conjuring of spirits, peregrinations, the authority of the Bishop of Rome, with all his hierarchy, and the terrible decrees of the Council of Trent, and ye are such a brigade of papists, an anti-Christian crew, that no honest man, if ye were known into him or to yourselves, would keep any conversation with you. We are censured, that we desire this work to be prosecuted without presuming or usurping to prescribe laws and rules of reformation to our neighbours, and that by our wishes and desires we intend no ways to pass our bounds in prescribing and setting down rules and limits to his majesty and houses of parliament, their wisdom or authority, in the way of prosecution hereof. If this assertion he not just and reasonable, then let it be said, we desire this work to be prosecuted by presuming to prescribe laws and rules of reformation to our neighbours, and that by our wishes and desires we intend to pass our bounds in prescribing and setting down rules and limits to the King's Majesty and his Houses of Parliament, to their wisdom and authority, in the way of prosecution hereof. If this be too imperious, why was the first taxed, unless that for wishes you require action, and speedy and powerful assistance to your Parliament? The petition is invaded, because it doth declare, that we think ourselves obliged in every cause which may concern his majesty's honour, to concur with our friends and followers in quiet manner or in arms, as we shall be required of his majesty's counsel or any having his authority, which, say ye, if understood and applied right, no honest subject can deny. Then why do ye, if ye be honest subjects, deny it? because it is meant in our petition, as an opposition to your petition, and if your petition be an opposition to that, which understood and applied right, no honest subject can deny, what sort of petitioners are you, but men born to the great disquiet and disturbance of the people, without fear of God, without observation of oaths, as beginning to equivocate them, and any religion? But who shall apply this aright, and who shall make it understood? Shall not the king and his council, shall not the former ancient practice and laws of this kingdom show how to apply this aright, and make it understood? That power the kings of Scotland have in raising of their subjects of Scotland, to take arms with them, is no new thing to be applied and understood. It was never doubted but the undoubted right of the king is to arm or disarm any subject at his pleasure. Shall men, as Buchanan gives their character, foris in bells, domi seditiosi, omnunc periculorum in experts, apply this aright? Make us understand when we shall take arms for our native prince, and when not. Shall we attend no other trumpets, than what their men from their chairs, which should be the places of glad tidings of salvation, found abroad? Shall these men be supreme arbiters of peace and warring kingdoms, enthrone kings and dethrone them, according to their goodwill and pleasure? Raise seditions and insurrections amongst the people and appease them after their fancies? 
and yet we shall not have liberty to say. They do kingdoms and commonwealths wrong, nor to call them incendiaries. Churchmen should not be our guides in the way of loyalty to our princes, but in the way of knowledge of our own duties in difficult points of religion. But let us hear how these men by their gloss of Orleans labour to overthrow the text, we acknowledge before God, and profess before the world, that by one a covenant we are bound to the uttermost of our power, with our means and lives, to stand to the defence of our dread sovereign the King's Majesty his person and authority, in defence and preservation of the true religion, laws and liberties of this Kirk and Kingdom, likewise in every cause which may concern his Majesty's honour, according to the laws of this kingdom and the duty of good subjects, to concur with our friends and followers, in quiet manner and in arms, as we shall be required of his majesty, his council, or any having his authority. This is the oath, as it is of new cited in your declaration, but what subjoin ye to it? Instead of answering how ye observe it, ye wrangle and elude it by telling us our covenant is copulative, and demanding hard questions, as, why we never urged in our petition any point of the covenant, except this? as if we should have put in our petition some holy water or the baptizing of bells, which are in the covenant, telling us we are bound to fight, by our oath in the covenant, for the propagation of religion, and to amend our lives by the oath of the covenant, as if at every time we receive the holy and blessed sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are not more fearfully obliged to the amendment of our lives, than by that golden calf of our own invention, how much do we rejoice like new Pygmalions in the works of our own hands? objecting to us, that we labour to advance the uniformity of Kirk government by Christian wishes and fair means, that we offer our arms for assistance of the king, whilst the rest of the kingdom are desiring an assembly and parliament to consider their interest. And then ye ask, to scorn us, grave men, whether we think ourselves the best covenanters, and that we only are the men who would render unto Christ what is Christ's, and to Caesar what is Caesar's? Now, brethren, what have ye been doing by the continuance of such frivolous periods, but seeking how ye might at this time shift the oath, and by idle demands trifle till us find out equivocation, both impious and absurd? We will only answer one of your demands. That we are bound to the cause of religion, by our covenant, and to stand to the defence thereof in the doctrine and discipline of the Kirk of Scotland, which was at that time when we subscribed the oath. At the subscribing of our covenant there was no mention, neither any intention, which any, except the secret plotters could perceive for the change of the government, then in the Church of Scotland, which was optimacy, as the promoters, contrivers, and such who offered the subscribing of it lately to the nobles, barons and common people, upon their great oaths and consciences and as they shall one day answer to the great judge of the world, to whom we appeal can testify. Some have now begun to aver, that ye are bound to preserve the king in his person and authority only relatively, viz. In so far as he will approve your new models of religion and imaginary liberties. Far less was it ever thought on, or could it enter into the most capricious brains, that we should be challenged by that oath, and obliged to alter the government of the Church of England, for the following of the propagation of the religion abroad, ye give us the answer yourselves, that it is only within our own kingdom, and according to the laws thereof, and by express limitation, though ye urge it in another sense. Other ways by the oath of our covenant every man should be bound, like the apostles, to wander about this globe of the earth, preach, and, according to your new positions, fight but tells for the propositions of our covenant, where meeting with so many walled cities and impregnable castles, such numbers of armed enemies, so many nimrods, zanzunmims, adversaries to our opinions, it would be the work of giants to make them ours, and to constrain the inhabitants of the earth to swear and subscribe. With us when an oath, the only chain upon earth, which ties the consciences of men, and knitteth together all humane societies, should oblige you to arise in arms and assist your distressed and wronged king, ye after that same very slyness and canning, by which ye first imposed it upon the people, endeavour now to make evasions and equivocate it. Are ye not tainted with fear and with shame, first to make a people swear, and after, upon that same oath, to turn them perjured, and tear in sunder all the bonds of humane conversation? I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God, e. Consider what a great inconvenience it is to make a breach in this high point of state, to open an entrance for all disorders, wherein ambition and insolence may range at large. For as mischief is of that nature, that it cannot stand but by being supported by another evil, and so multiplieth in itself, till it come to the highest, and then goes to ruin with its proper weight, so minds once exceeding the bounds of obedience, cease not to strengthen one boldness by another, until they have involved the whole state in confusion. 
First, ye reason, that ye are not bound to rise now in arms for the defence of your sovereign, notwithstanding this oath, because to rise for defence of the king would make void the treaty ratified by the public faith of the kingdom. Next, that it is against an act of parliament, discharging all taking up of arms against the kingdom and subjects of England, upon any pretence whatsoever, without consent of parliament, declaring the breach of peace, and that after three months' warning. There were never any articles of any treaty of peace between nation and nation, nor acts of parliament of a nation itself, but they suffer their own exceptions, to take arms for our native king, now king of England, is not to take arms against the subjects and kingdom of England, but against the rebels and traitors of England, which cannot be named the kingdom of England, and the articles of the treaty of peace and act of parliament cannot be otherwise understood. Neither in case of a sudden and perfect rebellion of the whole subjects of England against our native king, to whom we have sworn homage and fidelity, are we obliged to observe these articles of peace, nor the act of the circumstances of a decree of Parliament, and that after three months' warning for denouncing of war. Rebellion carrieth after it such fearful and sad consequences, that small interest gives place unto the great. This were a strange fort of conceiving articles of a treaty between Scotland and England, that the English shall rise in arms against the native king of the Scots, all sworn to maintain his parson and authority, fight him in open field with displayed banners, and, which God of it, take him, imprison him, and oppose him, and the brave men of Scotland all the while shall lie still quiet, conjured with the magic of some paper articles, see his blows, be witnesses of his misery, and stay calling. Dastardly upon a parliament. If the kingdom of England, which they have not done, for the bravest noblest and best of that kingdom are attending the service of their sovereign, and only a wretched oligarchy have combined, should break their oath of fidelity to our king, now their sovereign, and make a general insurrection, committing perfect rebellion, the articles of the treaty of peace being first broken by them, and in such a woeful case, we are not bound to adhere unto them, and celerity being the life of action, we were miserable to lose time and attend the flow march of a parliament. Let our king be restored to that estate he was in when he received the crown of England, to whose obedience these perfidious men then swore, let him be restored to those prerogatives his father King James enjoyed, Queen Elizabeth, though a woman, enjoyed, Edward VI, though a child, enjoyed, all Protestant princes, and what his other predecessors kings of England possessed, let that be given to God which is God's, and to Caesar that which is Caesar's, or we for our own parts, and we have fair. Hopes the whole loyal and loving subjects of Scotland will do the same shall be ready in what may concern his majesty's honour, each one in his respective vocation, place and interest, with our friends and followers, in quiet manner or in arms, as we shall be required of his majesty's counsel, or any having his authority, to hazard our lives, fortunes, estates, and what we hold dearest, never regarding the articles of any treaty, or waiting the motion of a parliament. Ye say, we go about to perform more than the king's majesty requireth of us, who is not craving our assistance, good subjects should be like blood, which uncalled rusheth to all wounds of the body. Do ye not know, faith your declaration, that the covenant, the anvil upon which the hammers of some gross cyclops are perpetually beating, was subscribed in the year 1591, and again in the year 1591, before King James was King of England, and therefore cannot be extended to municipal debates? a strange corollary and most unreasonable reason. The covenant subscribed then containeth the same very heads which we have subscribed in our late covenant. Now, we require, if the Parliament of England, after the death of Queen Elizabeth, should have denied the title and right of King James to the crown of England, and taken arms against him for challenging a crown as justly due unto him, as the crown of Scotland, whether or not, by the oath of that covenant, were not all the subjects of Scotland, at least the subscribers, obliged at that time to have hazarded their lives and fortunes, to have installed him, and set the crown of England upon his head? We think no reasonable man will question it the oath of our covenant, if not stronger, being the same, the son of King James and his successors having the like quarrel, as being deprived of his royal prerogatives, and spoiled of the richest gems of his diadem, by the like men, who might have rejected his father, are not we by that same oath bound to repossess and aid him after the same manner, and not to stand upon limitations, torturing, resting, and wringing oath after a Jesuitical subtlety. When there is no such knots in the oath of the covenant, but, ye say, it belongs to you alone to expose the covenant, but ye should then alone have sworn and subscribed it, since that which concerns many should be understood and approved by many, and not by some particular usurpers over the consciences of other men. Quod oms tangit ab omnibus debit approbari. 
omitting and passing over the oath of our covenant, are not we by that oath of allegiance, fidelity and homage, which as subjects we swear to our prince, obliged to stand to the defence of his person, authority and honour? Our sending of forces into Ireland, if we had been required, and the king had went thither in person, would have been a necessary duty, and not a bare voluntary testimony of our high respect to our king, whole companions we are of late become, and of our kindness to England. Are not the noblemen of this country and gentlemen bound by the tenures of their lands, in a lawful war, to repair to the king's standard, and neither by declarations of rebels, nor the rhetoric of some abused churchmen, to be detained from him? Did not the nobility of England, and the flower of the gentry, follow their kings into France? Did not the nobility and gentry of France follow their kings into Italy, for the preserving of the Duchy of Milan and Kingdom of Naples? Did not we always follow our kings into England? And why should we now, slumbering in idleness, here tell of the sufferings of our king, in which every true subject is concerned, and send him word, it is not in our covenant to debate his quarrels with his rebel parliament, though he should fall under their arms? Let not this be verified amongst us, principibus de conjuratione non credit missi peremptis. The security of the nobility and gentry depends upon the crown, otherwise popular government will rush in like a torrent upon them. If the king doth adore any other god but whom he should, if he aspire to any other heaven, embrace any other belief, any other baptism, if he be an idolater, if a heretic, despiser of god and man, let us take arms against him. If he be an oppressor, if he hath imbrute our scaffolds with innocent blood, if he hath dishonoured our wives, ravished our daughters, robbed us of our riches, lands and possessions, let us take arms against him. If he hath denied the meanest of all his subjects justice, if he hath not granted us more than any of his ancestors, nay, all that have done before him, what city, nay, private honest man fought anything which was lawful, and what he might give, who departed with their sad countenance, let us take arms against him. But if he be more devout than the most religions of his subjects, if he be more free of the great and roaring sins of his kingdoms, than any of his subjects, if he hath laboured to maintain the true Protestant religion, to the uttermost of his power, if he hath never offered offence to any man, either in his estate or person if he be the best man in all his dominions, and via Magonis guia bonus, why should we hear the whispering of taking arms against him? Why should we not arise in arms for him? Let the most malicious of this new oligarchy tell what he hath done, tell why they will not suffer him to reign, and to live, after that form of government, religion and obedience in which his father, Queen Elizabeth and Edward VI, reigned and lived. What other people had to make them happy, which was not in his dominions enjoyed, safety from being oppressed by any at home, and peace abroad with strangers and neighbour kingdoms, plenty everywhere. If that prince vulgarly be esteemed a good king whose virtues are not overbalanced by vice, how dear should we hold this prince, in whose life, the most envious I cannot by spy notorious vice? There is not a greater wickedness, than when benefits and favours are turned against him, from whom they are received. We are accused, that we could not be moved to part from our petition nor to acknowledge our errors, either in the matter or manner of petitioning, perhaps that is not right and just, which is really right and just, hut that which ye determine and decree so to be, by the advantage of your own affairs. Doth the essence of things change according to your appointments? Make an act against the ebbing and flowing of the seas, and that our winters be not too long, nor our summers so cold and when ye are obeyed, we shall believe your traditions. Let the two petitions be quarrelled, and then shall it appear, which of them hath the greatest reason, and whence the errors flow, either in the matter of form of petitioning. Our petition is for our native king, to whom we have sworn fidelity, that he suffer not either in his honour, person or authority, your petition is for men, who have combined themselves together against him, raised armies to make him suffer, not only in his honour and authority, but who endeavour to endanger his royal person, as their cannon and musket balls, so seriously discharge against him, do testify. Our petition is for the preservation of that peace and liberty we have so graciously, by the mercy of Almighty God, obtained, and for the present enjoy, and not to make ourselves umpires of neighbour debates, involve ourselves in new disorders, making other men's cases our quarrels, your petition is for the endangering of our peace and liberties, by encouraging those, who for their own interest pretend religion, and for altering the ancient and long-established government of a stranger nation. Our petition is, that the true Protestant religion, so deeply wounded in this life, may recover strength and power, heretics may be punished or suppressed, sects and shillings taken away, the king may be obeyed, brotherly love continued between the two nations, justice executed, the strong not oppressing the weak, nor the guilty the innocent, the people may enjoy their own in quietness, and not be longer galled with the grievous burdens of insolent men and oppressors.
your petition is that the Protestant religion may yet receive more deadly wounds by mutual discords and battles for the external form of the government of the church, that the proceedings of the pretended parliament be in everything and always approved, the king's majesty's proceedings, how just soever, be ever condemned, the strong may keep under the weak and the guilty the innocent, a fair way may be given to rebellion. In these tumultuous times, wars may continue, soldiers and men, whose miserable fortunes at home may turn them to any mischief abroad, be made rich, the more peaceable sort of honest people become indigent and beggars, neither having to entertain their poor lives, nor to provide for their miserable children, whilst the whole monies of the kingdom shall be taken up, under pretense of the public charges, every man's estate taxed, to hold up our utopian commonwealth, entertain bloody cutthroats, as your apostle in his story nameth them, and turn this isle a. Scorn to the transmarine nations abroad, as if the genius of the state had quite forsaken virtue. For the form and manner of presenting your petition, ye know ye were sent for, and by letters sought and required, upon particular informations given you from men, whole interest is the confusion of the matters of the state and church, and who stand by wearying the commonwealth with disorders, and oppressing of the shires of the country by new officers and magistrates, the liberty of approaching war making all things lawful to the fury of the strong. It was presented in a tumultuous manner, and little differing from that, after which the petitions were given into the Parliament at Westminster our petition was tendered by men foreseeing the dangers and calamities the kingdom and state were like to fall into, and who had striven, according to their power, to resist the avarice and cruelty of an arbitrary power, from free and loyal hearts to the Protestant religion, kingdom and prince. Posterity, who will neither be afraid of you, nor flatter is, will discern which of the two petitions is most agreeable to religion and reason. Ye had a necessity, ye say, to emit a declaration, for vindicating your present and past proceedings, yea, brethren, and for what you are yet hatching, but whether are your proceedings vindicated by your declaration, or doth your declaration require a new vindication? Ye are washing a black moor, Ethiopian, but have not yet turned him white. Implore ye your belma multorum capitum, nec enim illis, faith tacitus, judicium aut veritas, we appeal unto Caesar, to whom, by the prerogatives of all kings, the last appeals belong, and whom we acknowledge to be God's lieutenant in this kingdom. After all, ye make your declaration good, by enjoining it to be read through the churches of this kingdom, lest ye should be thought garite perangulos. Your declaration proves itself to be conscious of some great crimes, by taking sanctuary which if it had not done, it could hardly have escaped the violence or justice of apothecaries, spice, sugar, and tobacco sellers' hands, it being published rather out of obstinacy to adhere to your own opinions, than zeal of the true Protestant religion. What time will be sufficient to blot out this blemish? What other action could ye have done, more joyful to the enemies of the Protestant religion, more woeful to the favourers of it, and more shameful to yourselves? For conclusion, ye leave the matter, and betake you to the persons, unto some of which, ye carry greater spleen, than to the action of petitioning, these ye distinguish into malignants, and incendiaries, and in not malignants and not incendiaries, who, ye say, are unequally yoked against your own work, which ye call the work of God, unless ye thus understand the cruel war which ye are to raise amongst us. For ye know non ist malum in civitate quod non facit dominus, or name ye your innovations the work of God, as ye name many a seditious and nonsensical declaration, the word of God. Or as your late declaration, when it was read in the churches, was the holy word of the blessed Trinity? Presumptuous churchmen, in most parts of the kingdom of Europe, have proven worse than the foxes of Samson, they but burnt the corns, when the fields were white for the harvest, but these have burnt whole towns, male and female, children and old men, guilty or not guilty, holy or profane, turning all under the law of their spoil and licentiousness, dyed the white fields in blood, turned them into a Golgotha, as in our own country that one battel of Pinky can testify, where a churchman was. Both the loss of the field and commonwealth they are firebrands of strife, trumpets of sedition, the red horses, whose sitters have taken peace from the earth. There is no Christian country which hath not by their devices been wrapped in wars, they carry the common people, like hawks, hooded into dangers and destruction, make them believe that the mountains shake, when the moles do cast up, imposing upon their credulity with vain shadows. A general infatuation precedes the perdition of a people. Incendiary and malignant are the words of the language of Babel, and we retort them upon the first petitioners, and those men who are ever making all things new, but turn everything still worse and worse, whilst they have no bounds nor limits to their proceedings. They encroach every day more and more upon prerogatives, impudently they do abuse scriptures, using those holy records, as horsemen use their stirrups, lengthening and shortening them at their pleasures. 
the glosses of roving heads being infinite, the names of Guelphs and Jiblines in Italy, the names of huge knot, papist, Ravalac, Pillard in France, brought forth most cruel and terrible massacres, and if the mercies of God be not unmeasurable towards this LSLE, by all likelihood, the names of malignant, incendiary, roundhead and puritan, shall work and produce as horrible effects. By you these men are called incendiaries and malignants, who would re-establish the king in his throne, and have justice executed upon rebels, who oppose a vast arbitrary power, of taxing the silly people, spoiling the country, turning all upside down, by new magistrates, levies of soldiers, suppressing of all justice, public robberies. Sublata justicia quid aliad sunt regna quam latrocinia malignity is everything that is contrary to your reveries, a king that doth not punish rebels, shall never, during his reign, keep his subjects in peace, nor enjoy himself any quietness, to save the life of a malefactor, is to take the lives of good men, and to offend God and the commonwealth. There are no such incendiaries as those men, who strive to anticipate the conflagration of the world, by the distraction of states, raising of disorders and disobedience to princes, not only in every country, but almost in every city and family. And these men are presumptuous, ignorant, hypocritical churchmen, who take upon them the policy of state, and rent and deface the reputation of kings, making themselves both judges and moderators of all their actions, allowing them to fly no further than they give them wings, who, not keeping themselves within their own vocations, busy bodies, do assume the power of kings and emperors to govern the world, use an arbitrary power, first over the consciences, then upon the persons, goods and fortunes of men. Plotters they are of civil wars, and all under the pretense of religion, whilst they study to redress grievances by arms, plunging the whole country into mischief, making the remedy worse than the malady, as he who set a whole house in fire to roast some eggs. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of all temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but especially them who walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, f presumptuous, they are, self-willed they are, not afraid to speak ill of dignities, whereas angels, which were greater in power and might, bring no railing accusations against them before the Lord. And out of St. Jude likewise these dreamers despise government, and speak evil of them that are in authority. G. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Out of St. Peter submit yourselves to every humane ordinance, whether it be the king, or unto governors, for so is the will of God. These men have assassinated kings amidst their antics, poisoned an emperor by the very sacrament. These are they that set at variance the potentates of the earth, who, being freed of them, perhaps, would rest in a happy pence? Out of ambition to govern, they ruined the Christian empire of the East, and have done little better with the empire in the West they have set all Europe lately in combustion. Is not a churchman the Antichrist? They have turned at men's estate at this present time to desperate, that the living envy the dead, and may with they had never come on the theatre of this world, to draw the air of anguish and calamities, to be partakers of the barbarous dissensions amongst Christians, who are spiritual brothers, and should live in amity a perfect love together. Whilst now, any Christian should live in greater safety amongst the Turks, Jews and infidels, than he can live and draw out this miserable span of mortality, amongst men, professing one Jesus Christ with him. The Christian religion being brought by these men to consist in outward shows and ceremonies, rites, songs, springs, babblings and tautologies, regarding rather sonantia quam sol ida, tumultuary learning, disputations of more labour than profit, and in an ambition to live backward, to the religion of Rome, and what remains, being blind obedience to some general council or assembly, for insurrections against princes, tumults, murders, plundering all men who think nor their thoughts have not the like desires, judgments and opinions with them publishing, declarations one against another, fighting first by pens, then with pikes and muskets, to the great fightment of all who are not of their faith, especially of the Jews, who resolve rather to keep their ancient rights, than to be partakers of Christian dissensions. I pass by the fearful sentences of excommunication, and curses of one Christian against another, but cannot be silent of the new practice in this kingdom, who, having long waited this sword of St. Peter, and recently having stolen it out of the castle of St. Angelo, threateneth all men with it now, and wound some, like the roaring swaggerers, calling still for the war. Pure religion is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and keep ourselves unspotted from the world, h. For this is the message which ye beard from the beginning, that we should love one or another, I, nor as Cain who was of that wicked one, and flew his brother, and this commandment have we, that he who loveth God, love his brother also, k. 
God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he who feareth him, and worketh righteousness, is accepted with him, 1. Only by pride cometh contention, m. There is more pride to be found under a monk's cowl, and a broad Jesuitical hat, than under the fairest Christ helms, and the most oriental diadems of princes. They term themselves free, and are so indeed, inasmuch as they are not subject to reason nor civil duties. They are a people which see nothing but faults, because they seek after nothing else, they fill countries with calumnies, and at last with slaughtered men. From the violence and rage of these men, and their sapientia frenetica, Almighty God preserve all kings and potentates, and every good Christian, and well-affected subject, and grant the kings of Great Britain excess of courage, and true heroical fortitude, to bring under all rebels and hypocrites, who, under the mask of devotion, would throw them out of their thrones, and turn the church government and state, into an anarchy and confusion. For the better understanding of our author's preceding discourse, we thought fit here to subjoin the paper written by the commissioners of the General Assembly, as follows. A declaration against a cross petition. Wherein some secret letters of the intended reformation are discovered. The danger of division prevented. And the unity of this island in religion urged. By the commissioners of the General Assembly. The word of God, the example of the people of God, and of the Kirk of Christ. Since the beginning, and our own late, but very notable and never to be forgotten experience, may abundantly teach us, that the motions, resolutions and endeavours of the godly for the advancement of the kingdom of the Son of God, by establishing or propagating the reformation of religion, must meet with a world of opposition and hindrances which might make their hearts to faint, and their hands to fail, it upon the same grounds and documents they were not taught to acquit themselves, in doing the duty required of them, by the necessity of their callings, and for the success, to depend upon the unsearchable wisdom and invincible power of God, which are made perfect in the simplicity and weakness of his servants, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. There hath ever been in the Kirk of Christ, and shall be to the end, a generation which maketh more account of the world, than of the faith of Christ, doth conceive that differences about religion, are but the contentions of Kirkmen, that therefore there is no necessity of the reformation of religion, and that to know nothing of this kind, is the surest faith, and seeketh, in their service to kings and princes, civilly to supererogate at their hands, beyond the deservings of others, and above the expressed desires and commands of princes themselves, that the rewards of their singular zeal may be the greater, and therefore have proven, and daily do prove the most pernicious and dangerous enemies of the true religion, against this generation, which faith, let us deal wisely with them, we have this comfort and advantage, that we know amongst all the enemies of the truth, they least of all think that they do God service. We who are entrusted for the time, to be the commissioners of the late General Assembly, sitting at Edinburgh, for the affairs of the Kirk, committed to our care and diligence, specially for preserving of our own reformation and peace, against all sorts of enemies, and according to the interest of this Kirk, for unity in religion and uniformity of government with the Kirk of England, which was no new motion of ours, but a proposition made by the commissioners of the treaty which then received. From the King's Majesty and Parliament of England, such an answer as had been the ground of many consultations, declarations and public letters since, and of a renewed supplication at this time to the King's Majesty, and of a declaration to the Parliament of England for the same effect. While we are thus exercised, we are desired by some noblemen, barons and burgesses, occasionally met at Edinburgh, to send some of our number to join with them in a petition, representing to the right honourable the lords and other commissioners of Parliament, for the conservation of peace, their humble thoughts and fears, that the printing of His Majesty's letter of the date, December 5th, by warrant and command of the right honourable the lords of His Majesty's Privy Council, and the not printing of the declaration of both Houses of Parliament, unto which the printed letter was an answer, might be taken by the Kingdom of England, as an approbation of the whole matter, and all the particulars which it did express, and thereby to animate and provoke this nation against them as rebels and traitors, we finding that the petition did homologate both in the end and means with our commission, and the master of our present deliberations, did willingly satisfy the desire of the petitioners, and therefore, from our tender and dutiful respect to his majesty's honour, for preventing and removing of all occasion of jealousies and suspicions betwixt the two kingdoms, for preservation both of our own peace at home, and our common peace with England, and for promoving the so much desired unity of religion, a mean of all other most conducing to the conservation of both, did with them, conform to the order observed in such cases, since the beginning of our lair reformation, humbly supplicate, that the meaning of the publication of His Majesty's letter might be cleared, and that the declaration of both Houses of Parliament to their brethren of Scotland, might be printed and published, and see.
but behold, after a few days, a contrary petition is presented to the lords of his majesty's privy council, by some private noblemen, barons and gentlemen, which coming to our hands, we found, after due examination, to be nothing else but a secret plot, and subtitle undermining of all the present designs of this Kirk and kingdom, for unity of religion, and of all the work of God in this land, and therefore we made upon it the observations and animadversions following. 1. That private persons knowing that the commissioners of the General Assembly were sitting at this time, about such matters as they meddle with in their petition, and that we had joined in presenting a petition to the commissioners for conserving of peace, much about the same particulars, whereof they could not be ignorant, by reason of the act of the late Assembly, they did not so much as acquaint us with their intentions, that we might either have petitioned with them, or have advised them. To desist, which although it may seem to be but an error in the manner of their doing, yet doth it imply contempt, usurpation, and division, and being winked at, may be the cause of much disturbance and confusion in these times, especially they professing that they desire to clear themselves and their intentions, not only to the lords of council, but to the king's majesty, to the kingdom of England, and to all the world, which is nothing else but under the colour of a petition, to make a public. Declaration, contrary to the proceedings, not only of the General Assembly and their commissioners, but also to the desires and diligence of the commissioners of the Treaty of the Honourable Lords of Council, and of the Conservators of Peace, who have all concurred, and do still concur in their joint desires of unity of religion in His Majesty's dominions, resolving to press this unity to the uttermost of their endeavours, as a necessary preservative of our own reformation and peace, which without it cannot long subsist, and much crossing that clause of our covenant, wherein we swear, that we shall not cast in any letter or impediment that may stay or hinder any such resolution, as by common consent should be found to conduce for so good ends. 11. Although the petitioners profess with us that they desire the union of this island in religion and Kirk government, yet their petition doth too plainly and palpably tend to the contrary, as is apparent by this threefold consideration. 1. For remedy of the divisions and distractions in England, the petition desireth only the suppression of insolent papists, malignane sebismatics, and disloyal brownists and separatists, the special, if nor sole promovers and fomenters of these unhappy misunderstandings, and thus doth pass by the prelates, and balketh the bishops, who have been the most restless sticklers in this business, and the prime authors of all these tragedies since the beginning, and thereby would take us of our right and straight course of perilling uniformity in Kirk government, in the treaty, in our declarations, and in the general assembly, the apologists for the petition would have reduced the prelates either to papists, or to sectaries, but the authors of the Petition intended better service, by sending the petition to England, without trenching upon the lordly prelacy, or touching the prelares at all, which from strangers is an high provocation against the kingdom and parliament of England, and no small prejudice against the proceedings of this kirk and kingdom for reforination. 2. This petition doth indirectly cast foul aspersions upon these who are most zealous for the reformation in England, and doth very much symbolize with the language of the popish and prelatical party in England, calling the parliament, and all that seek after reformation, Bromnists, separatists, authors of tumultuary conventions, and c. 3. It hinteth at our zeal and forwardness in the matter of the reformation of the Kirk of England, which may appear thus, the petitioners declare, that finds the duty of charity doth oblige all Christians to pray and profess their desires, that all others were of the same religion with themselves, and see. Therefore they represent their wishes for unity of religion and Kirk government, as an expression and testimony of their affection to the good of their brethren in England, declaring further, that they defore this work to be prosecuted, without presuming or usurping to prescribe lambs and rules of reformation to their neighbours, and again they repeat, that by their wishes and desires they intend no ways to pass their bounds, in prescribing or setting down rules and limits to His Majesty and Houses of Parliament their wisdom and authority, in the way of prosecution hereof. And why do they so plentifully purge, and carefully clear themselves concerning this particular, if their intention were not to leave some aspersion upon this Kirk and state, as if we were passing out bounds, by presuming to prescribe rules and limits to His Majesty and Houses of Parliament, for further evidence whereof, it is to be remembered, that in the first part of their petition they plainly profess, that they are clearing themselves and their intentions, left they should be thought to be involved with us in the same desires, judgments and opinions, so that all which they say by way of clearing of themselves and their intentions, ariseth from this ground, that they will not be thought involved with us in our desires, judgments and opinions, and to condemn us in these particulars, in which chiefly they justify themselves. Neither can we knit together their words, or interpret their apology to another meaning. Now what is this else but to overturn the very foundation of all our endeavours for this work of reformation, which was the article of the Treaty for Union in Religion, and Uniformity in Kirk Government? 
not as a matter nakedly desired and wished for, but as a principal demand and necessary mean, without which neither truth nor peace could be secured unto us. The importance and necessity whereof hath been since that time so deeply laid to heart by this Kirk and Kingdom, that as the General Assembly, and we for our part representing the same, so the Lords of Council and the Commissioners of Parliament for Conservation of the Peace, concurring with us, have been, and are most serious and solicitous in the importunate and earnest pressing of this union in religion and Kirk government resolving to use our uttermost endeavours in the prosecuting and effectuating of such a blessed and necessary work, as being dearer to us than all our lives and fortunes. Neither did the General Assembly spare to represent their humble advice concerning the way of prosecuting that work to the Houses of Parliament, and to others seeking after reformation in England. Their petition doth tend to a dangerous division in this Kirk and Kingdom, for as it doth reflect upon us for one joining in the petition concerning His Majesty's printed letter presented to the Commissioners of Parliament, for conservation of the peace, upon a pretext, as it faith, of the not sitting of the Privy Council at that time, so it insinuateth, that we did presume to question or seek of the Lords of Council an account of their actions, both which are foul and groundless aspersions. Yea, it declareth, that the petitioners do so far dislike our petition, that they conceive they were wanting in their duty and allegiance to the King's Majesty, if by their silence they should suffer themselves to be involved with us in the like desires, judgments and opinions, thus plainly professing a division and separation, as well from us, as from other noblemen, gentlemen, burgesses and ministers, here occasionally met, with whom we joined in the foresaid petition, and not content to withdraw themselves from being involved with us, the petition doth also insinuate, that in their opinion we are involved in the breach of duty and allegiance to the King's Majesty, and not we only, but the Commissioners for conserving the peace, who did hearken and assent to our petition, and did seriously recommend to the Lords of His Majesty's Privy Council, that part of the petition which did concern their Lordship's clearing of their meaning in the publication of His Majesty's letter, by their causing print the Declaration of the Parliament of England. The Lords of Council are likewise involved in the same breach of allegiance, by reason of their grant of our desire in causing print the declaration of both Houses of Parliament, upon the warrant of another letter from His Majesty, and therewith declaring, that their Lordship's publication of any paper doth not import their approbation of the contents thereof. 4. The petition above mentioned doth import no small prejudice to the happy union and late treaty of peace betwixt the kingdoms, insinuating to the lords of His Majesty's Privy Council, that their lordships, in answering our petition concerning the clearing of their meaning in the publication of His Majesty's letter, might do no act which may give His Majesty occasion to repent him of that trust for aid and assistance, which he was pleased to declare in his letter, December 5th that he reposeth in us his subjects of this his ancient and native kingdom, whereby the petitioners do intimate their desires, that the lords of council might not declare that for which we did supplicate, but to declare by their not printing the declaration of the parliament, that their lordship's publication of his majesty's letter did import their approbation of the contents thereof, and so acknowledge their willingness to take arms against the parliament of England, upon the grounds contained. In that letter, when his majesty shall require them so to do, and for their own part they declare, that they think themselves obliged in every cause which may concern His Majesty's honour, to concur with their friends and followers in quiet manner, or in arms, as they shall be required of His Majesty, His counsel, or any having His authority. Which, if understood and applied aright, no loyal subject can deny, but it is meant and expressed in their petition, as in opposition to our petition, so in contemplation of the differences betwixt His Majesty and the Parliament of England, unto which their words relate for they profess to represent such particulars as they are confident will much conduce to the removing of all the mistakes betwixt His Majesty and the Parliament, of which particulars that is the first, that, according to His Majesty's trust expressed in his letter, December 5th, the subjects of this kingdom declare themselves willing and ready to take arms in every cause which may concern His Majesty's honour, being required by His Majesty, or any having his authority. And is not this to make void the treaty, ratified by the public faith of this kingdom an act of parliament, discharging all taking up of arms against the kingdom or subjects of England, upon any pretense whatsoever, without consent of parliament, declaring the breach of peace, and that after three months warning? Which treaty the estates of parliament did swear to observe inviolably, in the same very oath in which they did swear allegiance to the king's majesty, thereby declaring, that the observation of the conclusions of the treaty may well consist with our duty and allegiance to our sovereign, whereas the petition doth indirectly put some aspersion of less majesty upon the parliament, for confirming and swearing to observe the articles of the treaty, which in the opinion of the petitioners are inconsistent with our oath of allegiance. 
If they say that their petition did only insinuate that we may not take arms to assist the Parliament against the King, they put upon it a sense which it cannot bear, both because they knew that the supplication of the noblemen, barons, and others assisted by us, did not directly nor indirectly contain any such thing, and because His Majesty's trust expressed in that letter, which they desire His Majesty may not have occasion from us to repent, is not only a negative trust, that we will not take arms against him, but a positive trust and confidence, that we will be ready to assist him. And finally, because the clause of the supplication of the General Assembly, which they mention as containing our obligation to our sovereign, and that in reference to the present distractions in England, is positive, and not negative. Lastly, the petitioners for their own private ends do very much rest and misapply our national covenant, about which the whole nation, and all the members of the Kirk of Scotland, have as great reason, as by the mind of man can be conceived, to be most tender and cautelous, and which every one amongst us, according to his place and calling, is obliged to vindicate from every violation, and namely from sinister glosses and false interpretations, which may be the fountain and cause, the covenant. Being one principal rule of our actions and undertakings, of many scruples, transgressions, and disturbances. We acknowledge before God, and profess before the world, that by our covenant we are bound to the utmost of our power, with our means and lives, to stand to the defence of our dread sovereign the King's Majesty, his person and authority, in the defence and preservation of the true religion, laws, and liberties of this Kirk and Kingdom, likewise in every cause which may concern his Majesty's honour according to the laws of this kingdom and the duty of good subjects, to concur with our friends, and follow us in quiet manner and in arms, as we shall be required of his majesty, his counsel, or any having his authority. We know, that he who willfully transgresseth one article of the covenant, it being copulative, is by interpretation guilty of all. And therefore, under the greatest pains expressed in the covenant, we resolve for ourselves, all the days of our lives, and do exhort all others to that duty which they have sworn and subscribed to perform to the King's Majesty, but we desire to know of the petitioners, who are so ready at this time to make their own conclusions out of the covenant, which was never intended by it, nor thought upon at the first or last time, at the swearing and subscribing thereof, how it cometh to pass that. They never took the covenant in their mouth, but in this one article? Are they not bound by their covenant, and the same clause of this supplication, cited by them, to their mutual concurrence and assistance for the cause of religion, and to stand with their means and lives to the defence thereof, in the doctrine and discipline of the Kirk of Scotland, and to live godly, soberly and righteously in this present world? True conscience of duty and sincerity in keeping the covenant will make the obedience universal. Secondly, seeing the petitioners would only have unity in religion and uniformity in Kirk government advanced by Christian wishes and fair means, and yet insinuate their offer by arms to decide the municipal debates of England anent civil matters, while the civil and ecclesiastic judicatories, and the rest of this Kirk and kingdom are desiring an assembly and a parliament, to consider their interest and duty, and to contribute their best endeavours, in what is above the power of their Commissioners, to further this unity of religion, and remove these distractions in England, we ask, whether they presume that they alone keep the covenant, and would render unto Christ which is Christ's, and unto Caesar which is Caesar's, and that all others are covenant breakers? Thirdly, do they not know that the covenant was subscribed in the years 1581 and 1591, before King James was King of England? And that in the particular heads and articles it is qualified by express limitations and restrictions to this Kirk and Kingdom, to the religion, laws and liberties of Scotland. Therefore can no more be extended to municipal debates and to the laws and liberties of England, unto which we are strangers, than the Kingdom of England can judge of our laws, and determine our differences, the two kingdoms being still independent, and not subordinate one to another, but parallel, which is more at large expressed in the beginning of the Treaty of Peace. Nor is the sending of our forces into Ireland a necessary duty of our covenant, but a voluntary testimony of our high respects to our king, and of our brotherly kindness to the kingdom of England, as was expressed by the estates in the last parliament. Fourthly, do not the petitioners observe the limitations expressly contained in the words cited by themselves, according to the laws of this kingdom and duty of good subjects? which some of them may remember was interpreted in the assembly, as if it had been said within this kingdom, nor was there ever any law of this kingdom of further extent, a law and treaty there is, we know, forbidding it. Fifthly, may they not learn from the printed letter, that the king's majesty expresseth nor his confidence of assistance from Scotland, upon any ground or article of the covenant, which his majesty knoweth to be so obligatory among us, but from the obedience, duty and affection of his subjects of Scotland, without any mention of our covenant? 
but such is the supererogation of some of the petitioners, above what his majesty requires, that they will put a tie of the covenant upon us, where God and the king hath left us free. Thus have, we related the interpretation of the covenant made by the assembly, and vindicated that clause of the covenant, which is so far perverted by this petition. The petitioners hearing that their petition had given offence to the commissioners of the assembly, and that we were about the examination and censuring thereof, did direct four of their number with another petition, to give satisfaction to the exceptions that might be taken against them, as is contained in their remonstrance, which they exhibited for that end. But when in a calm and quiet conference all the particular reasons above written were represented unto them, and all means used to move them to part from their petition, they could not be induced, neither in the name of others that had sent them, nor for themselves to acknowledge the smallest error, either in the matter of their petition, or in the manner of their petitioning, only they made offer to join with us the commissioners of the assembly, in a new petition for unity of religion, and gave such glosses and interpretations upon the clauses of their petition, which were most accepted against, as could neither consist with the words nor scope of the contrivers and authors. And therefore, being desired and earnestly dealt with, they not only refused to declare under their hands, that no other thing was meant in the petition, than they had by word expressed, but also did shun to allow or permit us, the commissioners of the assembly, to declare so much in their names, as was contained in their own verbal expressions, intending that the petition should go through this and the neighbouring kingdoms, for the ends for which it was devised, and especially into England. For trust rearing all that hath been done, or is now in doing by this Kirk and Kingdom, out of their pious intention, and by their public endeavours for unity of religion and the peace of the two kingdoms, and in the meantime that nothing should be extant from them of their confessions and interpretations in the contrary. In this case we judge it necessary, and find it incumbent to us to emir this declaration, for vindicating our present and bypassed proceedings, for our silence and connivance were a breach of our duty to God, a neglect of the charge and trust committed unto us by the General Assembly, an occasion as well of divisions at home, as of jealousies and misunderstandings betwixt the kingdoms, a confirmation of petitioners in their error, and an indirect approbation of their petition, as likewise a cause of stumbling and doubting to others who shall read or hear of such a petition, especially to those, who, through want of discerning, are not able to prove things that are different, might be easily deceived by their pretexts and sophistications. We are nor ignorant that this petition doth very much reflect upon the Parliament, Privy Council, and the Conservators of Peace, but this we leave to the wise consideration of these civil judicatories, as they shall find themselves concerned. We have contained ourselves within our proper sphere, not daring to neglect our own duty, while we forbear to meddle with that which pertains to others. The petitioners are not all of one kind and disposition of heart, but are unequally yoked against the work of God. Some of them are known, and some of them have been conceived to be malignants and incendiaries from the beginning, but God forbid that they should now, by opposing unity in religion and peace, prove enemies to all religion and righteousness for then will it be both thought and spoken, that all this time past they have been lying in wait for the season, when their malignancy might appear, and it will be observed, that they who were of late at distance amongst themselves, are now at agreement. And that like Samson's foxes, they turn tail to tail, with firebrands in the midst, to burn up the husbandry of God, when now the fields are white for the harvest. It cannot be the cause of God, which is not either secretly or openly opposed by men of perverse minds, nor can blinded minds or hardened hearts, till God touch them by his power, choose but secretly or openly oppose the truth and cause of God, and therefore it is very necessary that such men take heed unto themselves, lest by their fullness of all subtly and mischief, and their not ceasing to pervert the right ways of the Lord, they be found to be fighting against God, which will prove. Bitterness in the end, others there be who have joined in this petition, to judge charitably, not from opposition to the unity of religion, they having done and suffered so much, and hazarded all for the reformation of religion at home, but partly out of unwillingness to refuse or displease their friends, to whom they are obliged by natural or other particular bands, and partly by reason of the specious pretenses in the petition, not considering the bad intentions of the contrivers, or the Dangerous importance and consequence of the petition itself, let such men, to whom the commissioners of the assembly with all true happiness, seriously think as well upon the condition of the work, and the quality of the company with whom they join, as upon their own intentions, lest they wrong both themselves and the cause of God, contrary to their desires, and more than they are aware of, and let them remember how dangerous it is to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, for their souls to come into their secret, and their glory to be joined with that assembly. If counsel be like the principal agent, consent is like the instrument, and to be instruments of, or accessory unto the hindrance of the intended, and so much desired unity of religion, which maketh a fair way for the kingdom of Christ through the earth, how great a sin if it 
and how great a sorrow shall it be. All this we thought good to express, concerning that divisive petition, and those who are joined together in it, being cast in our way as a stumbling block and rock of offence, for hindrance of the work of God, both at home and abroad. And as we exhort and warn all the people of God in this land, to observe them who cause divisions and offences, and to avoid them, so we hope assuredly, that no such courses nor counsels shall prosper, as do tend directly or indirectly, to the stopping of the course of the gospel, or to the suppression of religion and reformation, and that God Almighty shall, against all impediments, carry forward this blessed and glorious work, to the glory of his great name, to the advancement of the kingdom of his Son Jesus Christ, to the destruction of Antichrist, to the firm peace and happy union of all his majesty's dominions in religion, and to his majesty's honour and happiness, whom God preserved to reign long and prosperously over us. At Edinburgh, the 18th day of January 1643. The commissioners appointed by the King's Majesty, and his Parliament of Scotland, for conserving the articles of the treaty, do find that the petition given into His Majesty's Privy Council, by some noblemen and gentlemen, upon the tenth of this month, doth tend to the hindrance of their proceedings and endeavours in this public work committed to them by the King's Majesty and Parliament, and that it is prejudicial to the authority of this commission, the fame being in opposition of what was that day recommended by the said commissioners to the Council and ordain this act to be published, for stopping all farther progress of that or other petitions of that kind, and that it be printed with the declaration of the commissioners of the General Assembly made hereanent. 6. Subscribitor. Arch Prime Rose Clare, Commiss, 